Enoch. Uh, we kind of stopped last week because of the war that was going on. We went back through the prophecies uh, relating to Lebanon specifically is what we wanted to look at. And then I was going to go back to Enoch this week, but another upscale and everything, a different part of a war broke out. So um, we want to look at the prophecies specifically about Iran. Now, I have another video I did, I think, last year because I was trying to cover all those different things right when the Gaza war started, which was October of 23. So we have a few videos uploaded up there of that kind of stuff. But I want to go over a few today. Most of the time when we think of Iran, everybody points to Jeremiah 49. So we're going to look at that also. But there's a very specific reference in uh, Enoch chapter 56. And what most people don't look at is there's actually several references to skirmishes if for people in that area, and they include Iran, which uh, is an interesting prophecy um, in the Ezra apocalypse. So what I've been doing the last five years, if some of you don't know, is I've been trying to go through the Dead Sea Scrolls. When I originally started studying prophecy and things intensely, I wanted to look at the first and second century church fathers people that said they were taught by the apostles or the disciples of the apostles and come to find out they all taught the same thing. People didn't get different ideas until another century or two. So that made me feel better thinking, okay, well, if they believe the same way that I read the scriptures or pretty close and then throw in some extra information, that's fantastic. And then several years ago, when we were able to actually pull all the Dead Sea Scrolls together, actually start looking at them directly um interesting things came to light so if we read the new testament and we pretty much understand it it's self-explanatory most of the time the few places where we have different ideas on a certain passage which is why we have different denominations if you look back at the dead sea scrolls and then you look forward at the early church fathers and if you find the words are used the same the words have the same meaning before, during, and after the New Testament, then that gives you a pretty airtight I mean, understanding of what these words mean, what the thought was of the day. And so that's pretty interesting. So pulling all these Dead Sea Scrolls together, uh, we have another Dead Sea Scroll prophecy book coming out here in the near future. I hope to have it ready for the June conferences. We have a conference in Emporia, Kansas, first weekend of June, I believe, and um, another one in um, Colorado Springs with Prophecy Watchers. So it'll be our first one for this year with them. So anyway, let's, uh, let's get to that. And then we'll eventually what I would like to do is when this stuff settles down, and it will one way or the other, is to go back to all those prophecies. I want to create some good charts, some good uh, diagrams, some good pictures, uh, and go through... Um, the prophecies specific to our time from Daniel, Revelation, the Minor Prophets, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Church Fathers, and then any books of prophecy that they talk about that we can get our hands on to kind of pull everything together. Um, so let's get started. First off, we have um, a scripture, uh, Jeremiah 49. It points to Elam. There are several different ideas about it. So anciently, uh, when you think of Persia and Cyrus, the Medes and the Persians coming, that one empire, that's actually the probably three quarters of what we call Iran today. It's the, the higher part, the, the mountain ranges, that kind of stuff. The coastal area of what we call Iran is actually anciently called Elam. So when you're looking for prophecies in scripture, memorize the old names. So Gog and Magog, specifically Magog, is southern Russia. And I know people debate that, but there are old manuscripts that tell us flat out that's what it is. So, But I, I guess I should preface that because there are some subgroups of Magog that went other places. And that's why people get confused on which one. Uh, but Greece is Greece, Egypt is Egypt, you know, things like that. Those are easy. Those didn't change much in name. When you talk about a prophecy in the Golan Heights area, which is a hot contention between Israel and Syria, that's called Bashan in ancient, uh, in the Old Testament. So if there is a prophecy about modern day Gaza, or not Gaza, uh, Golan Heights, you would look it up under Bashan to 
see what it says about that. Uh, Golan Heights is Bashan. Gaza Strip is Gath of the Philistines. Uh, Lebanon is usually Lebanon. So that's another fairly easy one. Sometimes it's talked about Phoenicians or the parent groups. Sometimes you'll have to memorize the names of the parent groups. We'll see that today in one particular manuscript. And so there's lots of interesting things about it. And the Dead Sea Scrolls will bring those out really fully to tell you who they're talking about. Um, so let's look at our first one here. The first one is Isaiah 49. And again, so this is a prophecy about Elam, which currently is the coastal area of Iraq, or excuse me, uh, Iran. And of course, most of you know Iraq is Babylon, ancient lines. And then Le Lebanon, Lebanon goes on up from there. So let's look at this. Here is Jeremiah 49. And let me back up from here. In Jeremiah 49, it starts off giving judgments. And we assume most of these are back then. Some of them maybe now, maybe both. So with the way the Dead Sea Scrolls explain it, we need to understand it and look at it very clear, clearly. So this is, this verses one to six is Amon. Uh, so Amon, it's the same word for uh, the city in Jordan. So Jordan right now uh, is one territory. But as far as anciently in the Bible, it was Edom, Moab, and Ammon. And the prophecy in Daniel, of course, says in the last days, these three countries will come together to be one country. And that happened back in the 1940s. That's why we have Transjordan or the country of Jordan. But Ammon is part of that. And then Edom is another part of that. And, of course, it, it may have other ideas. Damascus, of course, is a city in Syria. Kedar and Hazor are in other places in that area. And then the last one here is the judgment on Elam. And that would be the coastal area. So right now, if there's some sort of a judgment, plague, destruction, war, whatever, in ancient Elam, that would be Iran. So notice what it says here. It starts off and it says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, uh, the prophet, against Elam. Elam, by the way, was one of the sons of Shem. So they're not Arabs. They're a different people. And that, that kind of becomes important later. They have the same religious idea as mentioned in the apocalypse, uh, Ezra apocalypse. Uh, but they're different people. And it's kind of important for one prophecy. So this is against Elam, okay? And he got this revelation, it says, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, and here's what the Lord says, the prophecy, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Now, this could be at any time at this point, but you have a warlike group. It's the, the bow or the... The army, the army is uh, being run by a king or a dictator or something like that. If the dictator is evil, maniacal, then you have a problem. If not, it, they could be a good, good um, uh, army for peace. So it's that kind of a thing. So um, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward these winds or those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. And most of us think that that has not happened yet. So basically something happens and that doesn't necessarily say anything like some of the prophecies will talk about something happens and the land becomes uninhabitable. So that might be here, but it doesn't actually say that here on this particular prophecy. Um, but something happens and there are outcasts and there's uh, a good number of them. So there's no nation really where the outcasts do not go. And it says, I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies <clears throat> and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them. My fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send a sword after them until I have consumed them. And not the people that are scattered, the refugees, but the, the, uh, the warriors, or if they have 
um, smaller armies that are proxies other other places. Um, I think of the French Foreign Legion the way it used to be a long time ago. But um, if America didn't want to fight in a certain war, we might arm this group and this group fights. Well, in a sense, it's America fighting through them type thing. And so this is this is what we're talking about. So the outcasts are scattered. And then his fierce anger comes upon all of those groups that are proxies of Iran. So that's kind of interesting to look at. So today we can look at it and, and you hear it all over from like Amir and other places and even on the regular uh, news that there are different proxies. So obviously Christians don't think that the theology of the Ayatollahs in Iran are correct because they're Muslim. Obviously, Jews do not agree with Islam, okay? But in Islam, much like in Christianity, we've got different denominations. In Islam, you've got sub-factions or, or groups. The two biggest that comprise probably 80% of all Muslims are Shia and Sunni. And uh, there are a lot of other subgroups, and we won't talk about them tonight. But basically, the Sunni Muslims, now in a sense, Muslims are Muslims. Okay, so the Sharia law and all that stuff in, in a sense. But as far as end time prophecy goes, what's causing this problem is that Shia believes that the Mahdi, their, their Messiah, will come and fix everything. The Jews are looking for a Messiah to come and fix everything. Christians are looking for the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who will come and fix everything. So in other words... Christians are not supposed to rise up and we're, we're supposed to witness and try to convert people, but we're not supposed to rise up and kill off enemies and things like that. When the Messiah comes, there will be a judgment. There will be destruction at his doing, not ours. OK, the main difference is when you get to the Shia camp uh, in the Hadith, it talks about this and gives it paints a pretty, pretty specific pic picture that the Mahdi will not come until there's massive bloodshed. Okay, well, if that's the case, then then it's you want the Mahdi to come, it's up to you to do something about it. You've got to usher in this kingdom. And we've had things like that inside of Christianity in the medieval times, you know, bringing ushering in the kingdom and things like that. Lots of people and lots of religions have. But that's the whole concept. Uh, we should live together in peace. And I'm going to try to convert Jews and Muslims to my way of thinking. They're going to try to convert me to their way of thinking. Nobody's going to kill anybody because we can't make converts if you're dead. As a Christian, I believe if you die and you're not a Christian, you don't follow Messiah. You're dying and going to hell. I don't want that to happen to anybody. I want people to repent uh, because I actually believe what the Bible says. Uh, and so that's this whole concept. So in the area of Islam, you'll have Sunni nations. Uh, and you don't want to go there and, and do anything against them. Every nation has their laws and are very, fairly swift. But as far as the concept of starting a World War III to get the Messiah here, that's not Sunni ideas. So the nation nations of, um, and I'm not sure who all is who, but Jordan and and. Uh, Saudi Arabia or Sunni. And that's kind of important to see because they don't like Israel, but they don't want to be wiped out either. So they know they're not supposed to start a bloodbath to make something happen, but they know their neighbors that are Shia would if they're like hardcore uh, Shia. And maybe you would even say Shia might be divided into hardcore Shia and, you know, insane Shia or whatever. But the point is, if you have a nation that believes something like that, be it Christian, Jew, or Muslim, but they think they need to attack, destroy, and take over, colonize, that's dangerous. And uh, if, if you think because I'm on the other side, they will attack me first, and you know that to be the case in the past, then you're much more open to working with other people, Israel, United States, maybe Russia, whomever that would be not that. So that's that's the, the situation here now. So most of what's going on is directed toward Elam. Elam has apparently, according to this, proxies. And if this is end time prophecy, which I believe it is, 
uh, they're going to have people that they fund rather than getting directly involved. But there's they, there comes a time when they get directly involved. So he brings the uh, the four winds of heaven against him. That's a, that's an idiom kind of for all over. So it's not between Israel and and uh, and I, um, Iran. Uh, it's not between Russia or just one or two people. This is like a world war. People or maybe not even a world war, but people from all four walks of life, for instance, the four winds come against him. Uh, so it says, uh, I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, those that seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them for my fierce anger, says the Lord. And I will send a sword after them until I have consumed them. So them and all of their proxies. So that's what we're talking about here that ultimately happens. So right now, we're seeing Iran fitting that picture. Iran funding and arming uh, other proxies, which according to Israel is Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, other uh, Shia groups that might be in Iraq and Syria and other places, maybe some in Egypt. Not necessarily the governments of these places, but there are people. And that brings in the whole concept of Psalm 83, which we're not going to look at tonight. But Psalm 83 talks about not 10 nations that come against Israel, but 10 uh, terrorist groups, so to speak, that are inside there. It gives you the idea that like Egypt is friendly, but there are people in Egypt that maybe Egypt can't control, uh, a sub-militia. And it mentions all these militias around. So very interesting in that respect. Uh, and since it's 10, a lot of people have said, is that the 10 nations? And Probably not, but it's something to keep an eye on. If you, any kind of a 10 or a seven-year thing we want to look at. So it goes on and says, this is the interesting part for me. It says in verse 40 or 38. Um, so all after this happens, there's an incident. There's people that flee all over and they're not the problem, but the warlike people continue and the proxies continue until the Lord sends some sort of a coalition or something and obliterates them once and for all. After that happens, it says, I will set God speaking. I will set my throne in Elam and will destroy from there the kings and the princes, says the Lord. So the wicked government is replaced, apparently, by a Christian one. Now, I think that's interesting because, uh, you know, we hear about the underground church in China and other places. Uh, somebody, and those things change all the time, but somebody was looking at the stats as far as they can tell. And they were saying it seems like the fastest growing underground church in a very restricted you know, country would be Afghanistan. And then they said the second most restricted would be Iran. Now, I don't know if that's true or maybe it was true and it's not quite. But either way, if it's anywhere in that neighborhood, that's pretty interesting. Uh, but it shall come to pass in the latter days. That's a very significant term. In the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam. And this word captives can mean slaves or just people that are banished. We see that because the Bible talks about two captivities of Israel, one in Babylon, one by the Romans. Well, the Babylonians actually enslaved them like Egypt did. They're in a place they can't leave. Romans just said, get out. You, you come back here, we kill you. You're gone. So they're dispersed. So it's interesting to see this. So we've looked at this and thought well, there might be several different things. I was privileged to talk to a pastor that is a pastor in a church in uh, Istanbul, Turkey, actually. And he, by ethnicity, is an Iranian. So he came from Iran, trying to get away from stuff, uh, came to Turkey and started a church. Uh, got the legal permits and everything, and everything seems to be fine. But he's talking specific about how the Iranians feel about Iran and the regime. And the way they look, or the people that he knew anyway, that look at this prophecy, is that uh, everything was fine. They become corrupted by evil. And that's when the Ayatollahs came. So when the Shah was ousted, the Shah may not have been a good person. Maybe he was a, a very evil dictator. I don't remember. 
Uh, but either way, it was a certain kind of government. When he was ousted, you have sh Sharia law coming back in, which is a, a seventh century set of laws, which as a Christian, I would consider very evil. Um, and I think most people do that study it would, would agree to that. So they go back under this kind of slavery mentality, and then they get to the part where they may or may not have even nuclear weapons. So anybody whose theology is I need to cause mass bloodshed for my religion to succeed, you don't want them having nuclear weapons or anything like that. Anything like what we saw um, this last weekend, or actually it was like two days ago, I think is what happened Saturday. So, and please remember what happened is um, there's always these skirmishes, these teeny weeny wars that keep going and that would irritate anybody. It, that needs to stop one way or the other eventually. But they have swallowed their pride, tried to work in politics, tried to do it for years. And then last year we had Hamas attack. So Israel responded by a war to eliminate Hamas, not the uh, Gazian people, but the leadership. Half the Gazian people like their leadership. Half of them think they're horrible. And they just want to live in peace and have families and, and not have problems. But that's going on. And Hezbollah from Lebanon gets involved. And we looked at this a couple of times, but there are specific prophecies about Hamas, the name Hamas being a government structure in Gatha, the Philistines, which is Gaza Strip. And it's supposed to be in this Una, according to another prophecy, which is sometime after 1948 when Israel returns. So there's a lot of interesting prophecies in there like that. Uh, and then there's some specific ones. We looked at Obadiah, I think, last week, uh, which is the prophecy about them taking and keeping southern Lebanon up to Zarephath. And, and right now they're talking about pushing Hezbollah north of the um, Latani River, which is within miles of that location mentioned in Scripture. So again, may or may not be happening now, uh, because things start and then some politician, you know, gives land away and starts a whole process again. So we don't know for sure if this is what's going on. But the fact that there is an Israel and Israel came back on the predicted date and they took back the predicted things and the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and Jordan were formed as predicted and that there is a Gaza Strip that became independent. Somewhere along the line, they have a government that's named Hamas, which means is a Hebrew word for violence, it means something else in Arabic. I know I understand that, but the way it's described in scripture, um, when you have things like that, Gog and Magog coming down and attacking the way they are described to attack, that's just not something that would could even be possible a uh, thousand years ago or let alone two or 3,000 years ago when these things were written. So it's just really interesting that those things are going on. Um, the fact that Israel, how would anybody know that Iran and Israel would have any kind of a problem ever? You know, but that's what's mentioned in the scriptures and other places. So this is interesting to me. So they're saying that this major incident was that, and when the regime finally topples, they're expecting a Christian nation. Now, the, there's still a vast minority in there, but I mean, if we're reading this right, that kind of is what happens. Now, to make sure you understand uh, the way I'm saying this, um, this does not have anything to do with the rapture, the tribulation period, uh, the second coming, or anything. All those things are separate. Very rarely do we get a prophecy that says a thing will happen so many days later, a thing will happen. That's the only way you could date something because everybody's got a different calendar. Um, we have some of those. We have uh, the Messiah is supposed to come and die for our sins in 32 AD. Israel was supposed to be reestablished in 48, and take back the Temple Mount in 67. And there are two or three other timeline prophecies like that, that basically say between a thing and another thing is a certain number of years. And so we have the years, but it's like, where does this fit in at? So we have two or three of those more, actually. Um, 
But then all of the rest of the prophecies are about sometime Damascus is destroyed and it happens this way. And sometime there's this thing with Lebanon and it happens this way. So where do those fit in? Is one before the other? And sometimes it's impossible to be able to say it's one before the other or date these things till after they happen. So that's what's going on here. And so this is why we want to look at the early church fathers to see if we have a clue, especially anybody saying, I wondered that. I asked John, so he told me this. That's the kind of stuff we're looking for. So let's go to some of the scrolls now. Uh, here is, we want to look at, first off, the Book of Enoch. Now, the Book of Enoch, we got to preface this because it's the Ethiopic version. We don't have the entire book in Hebrew or Aramaic. There are rumors that it does exist, but it's in the hand of private collectors. And if it's ever made public, there will be multiple people will produce copies of it. And it'll probably be fairly close to this. I already know that there are the fragments we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Sometimes the numbers don't match. And it's funny because the numbers in the Dead Sea Scrolls always match the Bible. These sometimes don't. So anytime you get a translation, numbers, names, uh, if you're talking about a certain red crystal or a certain kind of small animal, those things always get garbled somehow. But the rest of the stuff is usually pretty straightforward. Now, this is interesting because this is the same kind of stuff. And this is really spooky to me. I'm reading this. And if we back up, this is talking about uh, the fallen angels and a lot of stuff that happens. And this is talking about the pre-flood fallen angels where we have the Nephilim and all that stuff. And this and other books, uh, Jubilees and, and Dead Sea Scrolls, Book of Giants from the Scrolls, all those things, uh, tell us the history, the clans, how the Civil War happened, how they were destroyed, and the flood came and everything started over. So in the process of doing this, the fallen angels are chained. Now, the text says in multiple places, they're chained until Judgment Day, their Judgment Day, which I assume is Judgment Day great white throne judgment end in the millennium so that means they're out of the picture uh, except when we look at the book of revelation revelation has four angels chained under the euphrates river that are released as sometime in the tribulation period that's way like a thousand years before the judgment day so some angels are exceptions and the really weird thing is, because he's talking about this, he talks about the, the punishment here uh, of, of the angels and how they're chained up and that kind of stuff. Again, mentioning it. So this is the first uh, three or four verses. And then when you get down here, this is what's interesting. The conversation has been the pre-flood Nephilim are wiped out. The angels that started that stuff are chained and are out of the picture, except... And then it picks up in verse five, it says, in those days, and you know, you always wonder what days are we talking about? We'll have to figure that out. When a certain prophecy is fulfilled, which might be a long time from now, a long time ago, we have to figure it out. But in those days, the very specific time of a prophecy, the angels will return. So obviously not all of them, but at a certain point in history, Unless this is talking about millennial reign or tribulation stuff, which, I, which I, it obviously is not because of the context. There's at least a few angels or an angel or two that are released. They return. So that's just plum spooky. But let, let's look at this. So these angels or some of these angels will return and come to the kings of the east along with the Medes and the Persians. Now, your first thought might be, this is talking about Cyrus way back when. But Cyrus didn't do these things. Cyrus actually freed the Jews, paid for the funding of the temple, set stuff up, that kind of stuff. He's called God's anointed back in Isaiah. So that's not the Medes and Persians we're talking about. Um, so anyway, so they return to the kings along with the Medes and the Persians. So it's a coalition. Medes, Persians, and other peoples, okay? And Persians, of course, if that's today, it would be Iran, right? So uh, they will stir up these kings so that a spirit of unrest will come over them. They will rouse them up from their thrones 
that they may break forth as lions from their lairs and as hungry wolves among the flocks. So this, this is a connotation of, of um, animals that don't have logic. The animal is just, I'm hungry, I will eat. If I die trying, I die trying. They don't even think about that. It's just attack and kill and eat. So a wild animal concept. So, and, and you got to think about this for a minute. And I know there's a lot more going on than you and I know. But if you launched an unprecedented attack at any, any nation, uh, hundreds and hundreds of drones, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, all this kind of stuff. And no matter how it happened, nothing got through. Or one or two, you know, hit pay dirt, blow up a building, killed a poor Arab boy, you know, two or three little things like. But see, if there was no shield and you sent hundreds of these missiles that could easily destroy cities, uh, or parts of cities anyway, um, that's massive bloodshed. That's, that's like Hitler trying to exterminate an entire race. So that's never happened before. It would never been able to happen with the, the, um, the drones and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Patriot missiles got them. The jets got some of them. And it was really interesting to see for the first time in history also a laser system which is, um, I say Patriot batteries. That's what we call them here in America, but they're um, the missile defense uh, in Israel. But now these are a laser system that can actually start knocking out targets just with a, a flash of a laser. Um, and those worked incredibly well. Never before has that happened. But if I, no matter, even if you have three or four times that amount of stuff, if you fire all of that at somebody within a few hours and a few hours later, boom, not a big deal. And then you make them mad. That really ought to scare the pants off of you, as we would say here in America. That's, you know, you hit the big guy with your biggest club and it bounces off of him and he laughs at you and then he picks up a club. It's not a situation you want to be in. But it's amazing to see. Now, God's on their side. We understand that. But still, the technology is amazing with all the, the lasers and everything. So they come in like that. So these they stir these people up. For some, they just kind of go crazy and just have to attack and kill somebody is all we've got here so far because of the fallen angels. So who do they attack? This says they will go up and tread underfoot the land of his elect ones that would have to be israel um, and the land of his elect ones will be before them a threshing floor and a highway that's pretty easily and very descriptive if you're sending missiles there's nothing in the way a missile goes straight there you don't have to go up and down or go through checkpoints or try to break into a, a city to get over it it just goes straight there uh, there's some other things too about about missiles in here too the fact that they fly on the wind it's interesting prophecies which again you could say is a metaphor for having a very swift horse and they just fly and it happened a long time ago but not the way this describes um so anyway so that's what happens it says but the city of my righteousness that would have to be jerusalem will be a hindrance to their horses they will begin to fight amongst themselves. Now, when we see these, we always think, okay, horses, it's got to be a long time ago. Nobody rides horses. But these words can mean other things. Chariots, for instance, are what horses, horses and chariots. Uh, tanks in Hebrew are referred to as chariots, some of them. So I don't know if something's called a swift horse. Um, a lot of times there's classes of missiles called arrows. Uh, David's arrow is a missile defense system. So when you say they they hit him with arrows, a bow and arrow is not going to do anything. Well, that kind of an arrow would. So again, we have to look at these. Again, it's it's interesting to see that could be either or, but if they're flying somewhere, people don't fly until they have jets and missiles and things. So, uh, so the city of my righteousness will be a hindrance to their horses. 
They will begin to fight amongst themselves. We see this all over. When the Gog Magog war happens, according to Ezekiel 38, at a certain point, same thing happens. God sends confusion and one enemy attacks another enemy. So it's just, it's amazing to see. I've never seen it, but it's happened many times in the Old Testament. Um, so anyway, it says, they fight amongst themselves. Their right hand will be strong against themselves. A man will not know his brother, nor his son a father or his mother, until there be no number of their corpses through their own slaughter. Now, to me, I mean, this could happen a dozen ways. That could be like launch missiles. Boom, I launched them. Forgot to open the silo doors. Now they're all exploding. I mean, it could be a whole bunch of stuff. Could be a uh, virus in the systems that causes something to malfunction. Or God could just do what he does. So it, it could happen a bunch of different ways. But this is what's predicted to happen. So understand, this is a prophecy about... Um, angels coming to the Persians, causing them to basically go nuts, and they decide they just have to attack and destroy Israel, um, and they they are able to go straight there with their weapons because they fly on the wind, and Jerusalem is a hindrance to them. Somehow Jerusalem, or God, or somewhere along the line, causes them to be confused so that they fight against each other. And it says, their punishment will not be in vain. In those days, the mouth of Sheol will open and they will be swallowed up in it. Sheol will devour and destroy the sinners in the presence of the elect. Again, not the people. 90% of the people everywhere are not a problem. You have people that, that attack and murder and one person or two, which is, you know, but you don't really have very many serial killers with bombs that try to take out whole cities. You know, that's that kind of stuff. Uh, if you think of World War II with Adolf Hitler, um, nothing wrong with the German people as a whole. It was their government. Nothing wrong with the Russian people. Nothing wrong with the people in general. It's the governments that take over. Uh, America was the greatest nation ever, but we're, our government has gotten messed up. And as a patriot, we should like, you know, correct it. If it works the way it's supposed to work, there should be no blood shed. We realize this is wrong. We vote the people out. If it works that way, then that's fantastic. Um, our founding fathers were amazingly smart, but things corrupt in time. Okay, but anyway, and then it goes on, and this is interesting. I think this is the Gog Magog War. This seems like it's connected with Iran. May or may not be. But today I heard a rumor, uh, Israel has decided, everything's a rumor until it happens, but Israel has decided they will attack. They've got to do something. They can't just lay down. Um, at least that's what they're saying now. They may or may not. But when that was made public, like it's coming, <clears throat> then Russia originally said, if United States has anything to do with it, they're getting involved. So United States said, we're backing off. We will defend anything that comes this way, but we're not going to help you attack. We're not going to go over there because of that. Um, but now Russia is saying if, if Israel attacks, they will get involved. So it's, and there's reports of Russian troops on the Golan Heights, small amounts, but they've been there for a while. So it's, it's interesting. Again, if this is not the Magog war, Still, it's interesting that Russia cares at all and is there during a skirmish. And if this isn't the skirmish, the next one or the next one or, you know, however it goes, the fact that the players are all named in prophecy is pretty amazing. Hamas named by name. Magog, you know, named by name. Elam named by name. Just it's, it's not possible that it's a coincidence. And it's not something that will be avoided. Maybe it can be avoided for now, but it happens somewhere along the line. But like I said, the Dead Sea Scrolls give us a lot more clues to kind of pull these together. Um, so anyway, it, it's interesting to look at. Now this says, I'm just going to do this first part because this is another war. This is not the war that's currently going on here because it says it comes to pass after this. 
So the enemy is there, the enemy attacks, something happens, they get confused, they attack each other, corpses everywhere, they're done. So apparently war over. So five minutes, five years, 50 years, whatever, but some, it looks like it's related, but, or kind of, but sometime in the future after that, it says it comes to pass after this, I saw another host of men riding on wagons that definitely can be tanks. Chariots is another way of saying that. Okay. Look at this coming on the winds from the east and from the west to the south. Now, there, this is if we looked at a map, we could probably figure out who we're talking about at this point. But notice this it's, it's a host of men riding wagons or tanks. And it looks like these tanks, wagons, horses, whatever you want to call them, come on the winds. And again, you could say it's an idiom that they just came in swiftly. But today, horses aren't swift, not compared to it taking a jet somewhere or just even an airplane somewhere. Um, so this really, really seems like, and of course, it's talking about last days. So it really does seem like this is talking about our time period. Um, and it says the noise of their wagons was heard until the turmoil took place. The holy ones from heaven noticed it. This is the really bad one, not the Iranian one, but this one. And it, again, it might be one thing that triggers another really quick, but still technically it's two different things. The pillars of the earth were moved from their place. That sounds nuclear. Pillars of the earth were moved. And the, everyone, the angels of heaven, noticed. There's always a skirmish every five minutes and nobody pays attention. This one they pay attention to for some reason. Um, the sound of it was heard from one end of heaven to, to the other in one day. So again, normally, anciently, you, you don't come in and in one day take over or even lose a battle in one day. It's just not possible with the horses and the bows and the arrows pushing buttons. It, it can happen in a day. So very, very interesting. And there, there's some other things in here too, but just to let us know. I, so the interesting things about this chapter 56, this particular one, is the fact that it seems like Iran is people too. Governments are people too. Everybody should be scared of the other guy attacking. You know, mutual defense should make everybody calm down and be nice. Uh, it takes an, a, a crazy person to say, I will kill you even if it kills off half my people. That this just doesn't make sense. But that happens. And this says the reason it happens is because some of those angels are released. To me, that's interesting. Now, when we were going through the, the Enoch study, we went through pretty much the pre-flood Nephilim. And some of the questions are, how did we get them after the flood? Well, there are other documents that explain that. So that's not in our Enoch study, but later on this summer, I want to finish up with Enoch, do some other prophecy stuff, and I want to get back to that subject. And we're going to go through a series of, of scrolls and other documents that give us a great detail of what happened to the post-flood, or how did they even come to be? If, if all this was wiped out, how do, how do we have giants after the flood? And there's a very specific legend and series of historical documents that explain that from the ancient times. So we'll get into those too. Um, but I want you to understand that. So on, on your own, study and think about Jeremiah 49, Ezekiel 56. And I also want to take just a minute or two here. Time's wasting here. But this is the Ezra Apocalypse. And most of you know this as Second Ezra, and it was originally put in the Apocrypha in the King James. So if you if you have a 1611 King James, which they're getting kind of rare, but if you have one, you're going to have an Old Testament, a New Testament, and then a middle part, which is called Apocrypha. And those are they have errors in them, uh, but they're basically historical. Um, the only one that has any kind of prophecy is this one. And most people say, I don't want to look at that. It's Catholic. Most of the Protestants do. The thing is, the, the Apocrypha in the King James Version is Catholic. It's the Catholics have it in their canon. Okay. But there's one book in the King James Apocrypha 
that's not in the Roman Catholic Apocrypha, and that's this book here, because of how it describes Rome and the religions and the things that happen in the end times. Catholics wouldn't like that, so it's out of the picture. So basically understand this is this is Anglican Apocrypha. So, but there's a reason then that they said, okay, we will create an apocryphal section and not have these books in the Old or the New Testament, but to explain why we're going to put this book in there. It also explains why the canon is closed. But long story short, this has some amazing end time prophecies in it. Um, but in chapter 15, there's a section on the last days. And it talks about generally the fact that there's going to be morality problems. So that's that's easy. There's going to be a major destruction in Egypt, which is actually, I think, in scriptures also talking about other things, different wars and famines, different places. And then what we want to get to here is Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Iraq and Lebanon are somehow involved in a series of wars. And so we can see that because we have Islam rising up and a lot of these places used to be a part of the, the, the Christian Byzantine Greek empire. And then it became the Ottoman empire kind of, you know, morphed into it. So this is interesting here. Let's just read this. Cause I want to notice, want you to notice a couple things here. Um, the Lord says, I will call together all the kings of the earth to reverence me, uh, which are rising up from the, from the sun, whether it be the east, from the south, from the east, from Lebanon, to turn themselves one against the other and repay the things that they have done one to the other. So this coalition will kind of break up. And we can see that now, that, like we were talking earlier, the Shia and the Sunni. Forget the Christians, forget the Jews. If, if all that was gone and not a problem, there would still be infighting between at least Shia and Sunni. And everybody hates the Alawites, so I'm not sure how Syria is in power other than Russia. Um, not that I hate anybody, but I'm just saying it's, they both don't like Alawites and Druze and all the other groups. But um, so they attack each other. Okay, and it says... Uh, and this they will do to my chosen. So apparently his chosen are back in the land because they've been out for a long time. This, even if it was fake, would be written in the Middle Ages. So if it's not fake, I don't think it is. But um, So in other words, Israel returns. So this is happening sometime after 1948. Uh, and so also I will do, I will recompense to their bosom. So... What they do, God will do back to them. Thus says the Lord, my right hand, the Messiah, will not spare the sinners, nor my sword will not cease over those who shed innocent blood upon the earth. Now, anybody can repent. So that's what we're all talking about. We don't want anybody to go to hell. We want people to repent. But those that don't repent, that follow, as the Dead Sea Scrolls call, the path of the men of the pit, this extreme violence, it's got nothing to do with religion. If you're Christian, Jew, Muslim, or whatever, are you peaceful, a peaceful pagan, or are you a uh, horrible, dangerous pagan? And we're talking about bloodshed at this point, or wars, starting wars and stuff. Uh, so a fire has gone off from, gone out from his wrath, and has consumed the foundations of the earth, the sinners like straw that is kindled. So there's going to be a time of judgment that comes. Woe to them who sin, who do not keep my commandments. The Lord said, I will not spare them. Um, okay, let's just read that. I want to get down to this other part here. Uh, go your way, children from the power. Do not defile my sanctuary. There are people that are on the Temple Mount doing some sort of ritual during this time period that defile the sanctuary. And then Israel comes back is what it's saying here. Uh, the Lord knows those who sin against him and will deliver them unto death and destruction. For this reason, plagues will now come upon the whole earth and you will remain in them. For God will not deliver you for you have sinned against him. Not necessarily us, because it talks about the Lord will keep us from plagues. Not from normal sicknesses. You get the flu, you get the whatever. But 
these are specific plagues. And in some cases, it may not even be a disease like we're thinking about, but it's a plague of something. There are supernatural plagues that are mentioned elsewhere. Don't know which one this is, but so this is interesting here. So he, he sees this, this nation. So let me preface this. Uh, Hippolytus in the second century quotes this, talks about the senseless desert nations that are called the dragon nations. And what's amazing about this, the basic idea is that Arabs in general, uh, which are fine, the people are fine again, but the nations of those groups kind of fall in with this false religious system. And they're calling it the, the dragon religion or the dragon nations that are kind of demonic in this sense. But the interesting thing is you've got Turkey, who is not Arab, and you've got Iran, which is not Arab. So if you're talking about Arabs, those two are out of the picture if it's an eth ethnic type thing, right? So it's basically going to say that it's, it starts off in the Arab era, so the Arab nations, but it ends up being a major thing in Turkey and in Iran, which has happened. They're both Muslim too. Uh, so Turkey and Iran and several other nations are. But it's an interesting prophecy that a religion would spring up and it would start here. So it normally would be all these guys. But these guys who are ethnically not even close, probably don't even like the other guys, form into that religion also. So again, all these things happen and they don't happen until uh, later on in time. So that's why it's interesting to see these in this manuscript and know that there's there's something to it. Again, this this could be messed up. The translation could be messed up. So it's something to look at. But there's just too many things here. So it says he sees a horrible vision that appears in the east from where the dragons of Arabia come with many chariots, a multitude that will be carried as wind upon the earth. Now, you be careful of, of thinking that Saudi Arabia is the thing we're talking about here. Mecca Medina is in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is to the south. So in a sense, Islam started in Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia is Islam. It's Sunni Islam, not Shia, but still. Um, but that's one thing. They're talking about how it forms at this point. Now, in prophecy, Saudi Arabia becomes a great ally of Israel. And that's been going on and off for the longest time. But they are very concerned with Iran. So that prophecy may be in the works of being uh, fulfilled also. So he says, um, uh, they come, okay, uh, all who f uh, hear them will fear and tremble. Also, so there's this war that happens with uh, Arab groups or Muslim groups, in other words, and, and you're thinking Arab at first, but it says this, it's not just Arabs. It says also the Carmenians, and that is the parent group of the Iranians. So it's one of those odd words. It kind of means Persian, Elam, that kind of stuff. There's other words in there. And that's why you, we need to do word studies in scripture too. Anyway, raging, wrathful, with an attack like wild woodland boars, with great power, and will come and join in battle with the dragon nations. They will also lay waste to a portion of the land of Syria. And this goes on, and there's some very interesting prophecies in here about how Israel, uh, not Israel, uh, Syria rather, is, is a fine country, but there's this big war that lasts a long time, and Syria is basically decimated. And we know in Isaiah 17 that... Um, Damascus is destroyed in a single day because of something. Again, don't know when, don't know exactly what. We just know the outcome. And this is talking about the same thing. So there's going to be, again, we, we don't know how to pull these together in which order, but basically taking this together, and not even if we finish reading the rest of it, but taking this together, we have that there's going to be a rise of Islam. They're referred to by the church fathers as the senseless desert nations. They're referred to in this manuscript as the dragon nations. And, you know, at first you're thinking dragon Chinese, you know, but we're not talking about symbols. We're talking about as it would be in scripture. In Revelation, the dragon is Satan. So if it's an evil anything, an evil Christian, an evil whatever, 
it would be a satanic church, so to speak, or something like that. And then it would be, you know, considered dragon. So in a vision, you could see a dragon and other things like that. And they lay waste part of Assyria. So somewhere along this line, if we were looking at this and looking forward, we're basically seeing that in the future, not during the tribulation period, but as we get close to the tribulation period, there's going to be a war between Israel and Syria. I'm saying things backwards today. I need to go, go, go to bed. <laughs> between Israel and Iran. Okay. And because of Iran and its proxies, there will be a total decimation in Syria. Now, Damascus is still a city, so that prophecy hasn't happened. But we've also seen over the past weeks the prophecies in, from Obadiah and Zephaniah, Amos 6, and the other ones about how Hamas is a thing and how they came to power, pr prophetically how they would come to power, what would happen, uh, Israel and southern Lebanon, and the outcome of these things. Even to the point that in Obadiah, it tells us where the new borders are. The fascinating thing about that is Israel started off in the middle and then went north and then there was another war and then another war and then another war. And then, you know, and then that's where they're at now. Well, the new border is up here, so it hasn't happened yet. And we're told in the millennial reign, the border will be up here, way up here, and nobody attacks anybody. So we're done. So if this is millennial reign and this is current Israel and there's a war where Israel's border goes to here, that hasn't happened yet and it's not millennial. So it's, it's, it's getting ready to take place in the near future. So that's the thing that we're looking at. And there's a whole lot of other prophecies in there. We talked about those before. But I just wanted to bring this to your attention because so many times I love my Protestant brothers. I'm a Calvary Chapel guy myself. And I totally agree with Calvary Chapel theology. So we need to stick with the scripture, judge everything by the scripture. And by the scripture, we mean the Old and the New Testaments without the Apocrypha uh, or, or any additional stuff. That being said, if there are church fathers that say, I learned whatever from Peter or James or whomever, if that hasn't been tampered with, and you don't know for sure, but if it hasn't been, you need to listen to them when it comes to prophecy. And then we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and we see all these other prophecies, mainly dealing with the second, the first coming rather. Um, and many interpretations of Bible prophecy, but also many extra biblical books of prophecy, most of which focusing on the first coming. And when you look at the New Testament and other historical documents, they were correct. These things are written 100, 200 years BC. And yet they were absolutely correct. Messiah's death, his, the date it happened, all that kind of stuff. So that's pretty cool. So with that kind of a track record of being 100%, even Josephus says they were known to be 100% accurate prophets. But with that in mind, the other things they talk about like this. Now, this isn't a Dead Sea Scroll, this particular one. But it relates to all the material. So we need to study uh, Daniel, Revelation. Paul's epistles, because the, the Dead Sea Scrolls reference or point to the fact there would be a Benjamite that would write the answers to everything. So we really need to study Paul's epistles in the New Testament. And then this one, uh, the uh, Ezra Apocalypse, uh, Enoch, and other things from the Dead Sea Scrolls, Book of Giants, other things like that, and then pull those together. And then anything that they say, like the prophets wrote, and so we have like Gad and Nathan, Ahijah, those things that the Old Testament says they wrote books of prophecy. Pieces of them are quoted from other scrolls. And so we need to find those and gather all those together. And so we're making headway on it. But I have a sneaking suspicion we don't have a whole lot of time left. But I just want to encourage you at this point, we're going to stop there for tonight. And we'll come back and continue doing the prophecy Dead Sea Scroll type studies need to get back and finish our uh, Enoch um, prophecy or study. But I want to encourage you, this is the kind of thing we need to share with everyone. So if, ju just give it a possible thought, if there is a book called the Bible and other books that relate to it that give us prophecies, 
And if you pull them together, you've got dates and you've got events and you've got things and they go kind of in order. And that could be fiction for all you know. But when you look, turn on the TV and you see it happening. And we haven't seen much yet, like what's described here, but Iranians, Israel, back in the Middle East, uh, Lebanon, Gaza Strip. I mean, just, just those things. It's like, it, it's just that in itself. A group called Hamas. How did, I mean, how did they get those words right in the Old Testament? So we're going that direction. The fact that Syria was a decent country and for some reason a series of wars decimated it, it's pretty much decimated. Um, and it's because of proxies from the Carmenians. Um, so, I mean, it all, it all fits. So whether the rest of it comes, uh, comes uh, happens, we, we have to see, but it's in process. So if the Bible talks about these things and we see them happening, the Bible also says that God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die for our sins. And all you have to do is accept him and become part of the family. Um, the same one that's told you past, present, and future, and apparently is 100% accurate, is telling you there's only one way to be saved, to have eternal life, to escape hell. And the work's been done for you. And all you have to do is become part of the family. You can trust in that. There's no way that this book or this series of manuscripts could tell us anything about the future unless somebody outside of space time actually wrote it or wrote through it. So I just wanted to encourage you. So we need to, to study these things, look at what's going on now, talk to our friends and our family and get them to think about actually becoming Christians. And I would recommend finding a good church. There's a lot of good Baptist churches, a lot of good Calvary chapels, a lot of good churches all over. But find one that's serious about scripture, premillennial that studies these things that doesn't, you know, ignore them. Very, very important. So we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. I'm going to go over to the chat room and see if there's any questions. Oh, it looks like there is a few, are a few. Let's see. Um, did I get that? It should be. I thought there was another one in there that maybe it didn't pass through. Okay. Also, if you if if I start this, like say at three o'clock in the afternoon to get it all done, and you saw it came on and you that's weird, you immediately said something. There is a chance by the time I come on that the question disappears. So just Okay, that's weird. I went somewhere else. Okay, here we go. Now let me try this. That's the one I was thinking of at the beginning. That came in when we first started. Josh Peck makes a good case for Damascus, the Damascus that Paul went to, being the Damascus of the Essenes. Is there a specific reason why you think it was Damascus, Syria? Well, in the book of Acts, it talks about it's Damascus, Syria where he went and, and had to be let down the basket and all that kind of stuff. That's a, a commercial town in Syria. But he and I both agree that uh, Qumran was called New Damascus. And he does make a good case. I mean, he, he got a lot of the research from some of the same places I get my research. Um, and we've talked about it quite often. Um, but uh, the way scripture has it, that he at one point went to Syria, Damascus, and then he went up to Jerusalem and then back up to Tarsus, his own. So if you're looking at a map the way that is, you, he went up to Damascus, Syria and escaped for his life, went to Arabia down south, came up to Damascus and then up to Jerusalem and then up to his hometown, which is all in a straight line. So it seems like that's what we're doing. And in Acts, it talks about, in Acts and Galatians, it talks about he was gone for three years, which is usually the time it takes to study and become an Essene. He was raised, he's a Benjamite, he was raised Pharisee, and he started studying the Essene way, the, the Essene prophecies. That's what all these Dead Sea Scrolls are, is Essene prophecies. So he begins reading them and finding out he's mentioned in some of these prophecies. Very fascinating. So I would agree with... Um, um, Josh Peck on that. 
because as far as I know, he he recognizes Damascus, Syria as Damascus, Syria. But when it just says Damascus, it could be either one. So we're missing some of those things in there. It's a good question. There is a lot we could talk about, about the history of the scrolls and the history of the movements. It is one of the 14 nuclear sites in Elam. I believe there's at least one that's in there. Yeah. Um, I know there's, I thought there was 13, but that's, there's probably 14 by now too. So there's, yeah, they're think they're thinking of taking out the 14 nuclear sites. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. So the way the, their thinking is it's about ready to be fixed. The way we're kind of thinking is the incident that causes the dispersion might be getting ready to happen. There was a dispersion of people that left, but it doesn't seem like it's as serious as the one described in that manuscript. So we'll find out anyway. Yes, I believe there's at least one there. Uh, became a member, Level Angel, Ruth. Thank you for, for becoming a member. Thank you to all of you guys that buy our books and uh, uh, do donate, support us through Give, Send, Go and PayPal and become a member in here. And it's nice that we can have uh, all those things. The main reasons we have members in here is because when we started getting big, we had, you know how kids are. They get in here and start saying stuff they shouldn't. So it's a nice way of keeping those kind of people out. Kids that would play around. <clears throat> we do have a, a question if you go to the website, biblefacts.org, which you, you know yeah, you should see here. Um, so we have a Q&A. We have a private Facebook-like group. Uh, for study and things like that. So you guys are all welcome for that. Question, what is the best way to witness to a Muslim in your opinion? Is there material you would suggest that shows that the Quran is incorrect? There's a lot of things like that and you just have to, you can't start out saying you're wrong and here's the evidence, you're an idiot. So that, that part doesn't work. So you have to start out, I usually... And I'm not saying that I have a great success rate either, but when I try to witness to different groups, I try to do it with prophecy, like what we just studied. So no matter who you are, what you are, this said that, look at what's going on. And you might say, well, yeah, it, it, it didn't actually end like that. Well, it hasn't ended yet, but the players are there. The situations are there. Everything's there. That's just too coincidental. And you look at all the other prophecies. I, I, I love to pinpoint the, the prophecies about 1948 and 1967, how they, not, not just to the year, but to the day, the, the, those timeline prophecies are pretty amazing and they happen to the day. So, I mean, I don't know how you can argue with that. So that's the whole thing about it. I, I, I used to work at uh, the Sprint help desk in computer, su computer uh, support, had some Muslims on staff. And we used to talk about different things like that. And they would basically say, well, the reason why the prophecy was happened is because the United States made it happen. You know, that's their answer. It's like, yeah, they forced it. They, they're Christians, you know, they just made it happen on that date or signed the papers or whatever. And so, but my answer was, so you're saying the United States is more powerful than Allah? Oh, no. Well, then Allah allowed it. Well, yeah. So Allah could have made it different, but chose not to. So he allowed the prophecy to come true. So, I mean, you know, just a different way of looking at them. They're like, no, you can't, you can't look at it like that. Yeah, you can. So it's, it's really interesting uh, in that respect. I would just always go to prophecy and then come back from there. To me, that's the, the most amazing thing ever. Um, what's going on with the new prophecy watchers set up? Um, I'm not sure exactly. Um, all I know is, um, I don't know if they're doing anything new or not. Mondo came on board. I've been kind of, I, I was there at the last prophecy conference, right when the war broke out last October and they had, they, they tend to have one in the spring in, uh, Orlando. And I always elect not to go to Orlando. It's just too far. And and everything uh but they're having uh, prophecy watchers one in june in colorado springs will be there and they're thinking of having another one in branson possibly in 
I'm not sure if I'm, well, I don't even know what it is actually, but possibly around Christmas time or somewhere. They'll all be announced. I think they're actually trying to start doing one or two or even three things per year rather than just one. Trying to get more stuff out like that. And it is nice to be able to take your group to, to Branson, to Oklahoma City, to Colorado Springs, to Orlando, different places. Because some people won't be able to travel very far. And it's nice for people to get to know everybody on the on their shows and stuff. So I will be coming out with a new book. Hopefully it will be done on, on Dead Sea Scroll Prophecies. Hopefully it will de be done before June. So I don't know anything about a new setup, though, necessarily. They did say um, that they started a radio ministry. So they're, they are expanding. So other, you know, like YouTube, Facebook, other places, TV, radio. So that's pretty good. Super sticker, $9. Okay. Thank you very much for the donation. Really appreciate you guys. Why is New York supposedly worried about Iran? Um, I don't know other than the fact that it's one of the largest cities in the United States. If there was a somebody that came over with a chemical or nuclear bomb or something and, and somehow managed to detonate or a missile that happened to get over here, um, I attacking like um, New York, or if possible, it might be too far, but um, San Francisco, big places like that would, would possibly cripple the economy. They wouldn't want to hit a small town in in middle of the United States. Um, that's the only thing I can think of. Um, we know who Persia is, but who are the modern day Medes? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Um, there's been a couple of studies to try to figure that out, and I'm not sure that we know for sure, but some of the ideas think that the, the, at least some of the remnants of the Medes are the Kurds. Now, Kurds are, I believe, Muslim, pretty sure they're Muslim, but they're Sunni, or at least they're friendly anyway, and they may not be Muslim. They're, like I say, there's so many subgroups, but I, that's, that's one theory, and I don't know for sure if, uh, it's probably correct that that's a, a subgroup of them, like one of the grandkids, so to speak. And there may be other groups around. Since evil's, evil angels were released in the last days, could there, could it be partly at the time of oh, the Shah of Iran was deposed? Yeah, it seems like it. I mean, if we take this at face value, it's saying that Iran gets ravenous like wolves and decides to attack Israel, which is kind of what we might have seen the beginning of two days ago. That was a pretty severe attack. Remember, the, the whole thing is an escalation. There's always these skirmishes, which they ought to be tired of it and do something anyway, but still skirmishes or skirmishes. But then Hamas attacked. They went to war. Hezbollah entered. Uh, they went to war. Um, some attacks are coming from Syria and Iraq. Not Syria and Iraq themselves, but like, again, the little proxies or, or somebody in that territory anyway. The weapons are all identified as being coming in from Iran. They keep trying to tell Iran to stop. They keep blowing up the, the uh, storehouses of all the missiles and all the you know ammunition. So finally, at a, at a certain point, they say, we're going to send a clear message. And they don't blow up the consulate in Damascus, but it's one sub-building. And the main person they took out, it, their, their story is, I, I can't verify it one way or the other, but their story is that they killed the guy that is an Iranian guy that masterminded the Hamas attack. So it took out the head guy. It took out, um, it, it showed, number one, that they could actually attack unhindered, and they blew up one small building. The building right next to it is perfectly fine. So they're trying to send a message, just quit. You know, and of course, then I res the Iran responds with several hundred uh, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, drones, this kind of stuff. So, and then... You know, something's going to happen in the next day or so. 
As far as I know, I don't see anything yet, so we'll find out. But uh, yeah, so looking at this, that being the situation, if it really has something to do with an angel being released that's causing these problems, that has all sorts of ramifications to it. If you actually believe the Nephilim stuff and the old scrolls, to think that one or more of those are walking around somewhere. And it's long story, but it's just bombs is just the tip of the iceberg of what those creatures can do. So anyway, we'll see what happens. Again, we don't need to worry if you're Christian. The Lord will protect us at a certain point. We're the ones that, according to uh, 2 Thessalonians, hold back. Uh, we restrain the Antichrist system. And that we believe what we believe. We're not going to take any guff. We're just not going to comply. you know. And then when the rapture happens, we're gone. The restraint is gone. Then everything can happen. Uh, Joshua became a member. Well, thank you. Welcome aboard. Again, thank you for uh, becoming a member. In Hosea 4, 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Is this taken out of context to apply to those churches who... Is it taken out of context? Okay, to apply this to churches who tend to ignore prophecy. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily taken out of context. There's a main meaning, and I think the main meaning is Israel not accepting its Messiah. And because of that, problems arise. And to miss the knowledge that's in the... If you would pay attention to the Dead Sea Scrolls as much as you would the Talmud, you would find out what happened, and you'd probably quickly become messianic. So it's it's a question of the knowledge was hidden, the knowledge is brought back now, like prophesied in Isaiah 29. Um, so that kind of stuff is happening. Um, but in a sense... The whole thing applies. If you don't know about Christianity, uh, you know, like we have sin lists, for instance, and everybody's yelling at Christians for, you're telling me what I shouldn't do. Well, the reason is because sin hurts. It, it kills. It's not that God doesn't want us to have a nice time. It's like, if you have the nice time in that way, you're going to really, really hurt yourself. And there's no reason to hurt yourself. And so that's why. So we, we perish for lack of knowledge. Uh, can you imagine somebody wanting to be a missionary, for instance, and not paying attention to prophecy and going to one of those places right now, especially if you had some of the timeline prophecies? Again, the more, no, more, the more you know, the more that would help. We need to witness, but we need to do it carefully. So I don't think it's necessarily taken out of context, but there's a major one specific meaning, but it can apply to all of us. Uh, in the same way, if I start developing a health problem, I need to pay attention to the herbal medicine. And that's even what the scrolls talk about, too. I need to eat the right things or I'll probably kill myself. So in a sense, that would be sin to me. But that's not what it's talking about. But the concept is, is the same, I think. Is Syria one of the nations involved in Ezekiel 38 war? I believe so. We'd have to look it up and see. Um, so that means it doesn't get wiped out right now unless it's beginning to start. That's one of the things that's interesting because there's so many wars. And then you stop and think, well, what if those are all different prophets describing the same war? So again, those are one of the things that we don't know for sure. Why do you think the Bible never mentions a year by number? It's always in the year of a king so-and-so, reign or whatever. It seems odd. Yeah, it, I think in some of those cases, they're t they're telling you we're being invaded, so it's in the years of Nebuchadnezzar, so we know who we're, we're talking about. Um, but anciently, uh, the same kind of a thing, sometimes they'll say back in Genesis, it's why did they just not give a year instead of saying Adam was 130 when Seth was born, and then Seth was so many years old when this was born, etc. And, and what they're doing, it's a different calendar type system. What they're doing is setting up generations. So between uh, Adam to the flood, for instance, is 1,656 years, but it's 10 generations. And a generation is not a specific time period. It's just from when Adam started to when Seth took over or was born. You know, So it was in the days of Seth. 
Adam was still alive. Seth had already been born, but Seth's child hadn't been born yet. So you can kind of think of it as uh, when it gets to the Egyptian time period, it's dynasties. It's in the, in the time of this king. And so they're just doing the dynasty count differently. Uh, as an American, it does seem odd to me too. It's like, can you just give me a year? But when you look at the prophecies and you look at the Shemitahs and the Jubilee years and the Annas and the ages and stuff like that, you all of a sudden see patterns. It's really, really interesting. Uh, looking at just the numbers, they don't really show you a pattern. But like, for instance, Paul said the last, the, in the middle of the last uh, seven year period, is when the temple is desecrated by the Antichrist. Okay, assuming that's the last Shemitah of this age, we back up the last Shemitah of the age of when Jesus was here. That, that exact time is when the temple was destroyed. You back up to the beginning or the end, that last Shemitah of the, uh, the first age is when the Tower of Babel was destroyed. So it's just really interesting. It's like, I'm not sure how all that. Let me uh, turn some of this stuff off here just a second so we don't get distracted. There we go. So it's really interesting to see some of those things, but there's just so many calendar systems. So we have AD BC. We have um, the AM calendar. And then we've got the Essene calendar, which is Jubilees and Shemitahs and Onas and things like that. And then we have the modern Jewish calendar. We have the Arabic calendar. All those things need to be taken into consideration. So that's a good question, though. And I think it just became a... Um, also, it could be the king wants to do something like that. Um, I remember, I think it was North Korea. Uh, when that, the current family, I forget his name, but when the current family took over, um, the father or grandfather of the one that's president now, anyway, they kind of started a new dynasty. They changed the entire year system. So in that country, it's the year 120 or something from when grandfather started. So it's kind of interesting just to see that stuff. So it could be just the a maniacal dictator changing stuff. So, Jeremy, thank you for the donation. Really appreciate it. Became a member of uh, Veronica. Thank you. Welcome aboard. This would be cool. We have more people to talk to. Uh, we would like to try, we're, we're getting to the end of translating scrolls. So we want to try to probably this summer do more broadcasts because I tend to get hoarse when I go two hours. So two or three, 45 minutes would be better. So we'll see what happens. Did the Bible say that the Antichrist or the Antichrist nation destroys Iran with its supreme leader? Um, I don't think so. The main thing with the Antichrist is that he is a leader of a nation north of Israel. And that would give you the idea of like Lebanon, which that was probably too small, so it's probably not Lebanon, but Syria or Iraq or somewhere like that. Um, you might even say Turkey or Russia, but it seems like Russia's out of the picture as a world power with the Gog Magog invasion, which is why he comes to power. And then there's another prophecy about Turkey liking Babylon, whatever Babylon is or whoever Babylon is, likes Babylon. And when the Antichrist with the Ten Nations comes against Babylon to destroy it, Turkey sides with Babylon to kind of protect it, and that was that's its big mistake. So there's several other prophecies like that. So that means number one, Turkey's not one of the ten nations. Turkey's not the kingdom that the Antichrist comes from. It's north, but it's apparently not that one. And it's not Babylon either, you know, because it likes Babylon. So there's a lot of interesting things like that to kind of pull those together. So the Antichrist forms a, this 10 nation, and I have theories on how they come together, but I can't really prove it. And we, we discuss that. We'll, we'll discuss that this summer, try to figure out more things. Um, but no, it doesn't say anything about the Antichrist destroying Iran, as far as I know. Of course, it, again, it depends on the who's who on some of those scriptures. Who are the kings in Enoch 56? 
Don't know for sure. Uh, those are, if it's happening now, we can probably pinpoint who is on uh, Iran's side. Uh, so that kind of a thing. A lot of those things we're not sure. I'm just glad we have Enoch 56 to give us that detail. Um, would I be able to share a little from your book and share it on my channel? Yes, by, by all means, that would be a good thing. One of the things we're trying to do, what I want to do, is I, I mean, I, I want to survive and get, get income for the ministry and everything. That's one thing. But I want people to understand the Bible and the scrolls. So we've written books to do translations. There's other translations out there, too, that you can use. Uh, but I would love to get a network of people together. Uh, Chuck Smith, for instance, started Calvary Chapel. And we've got lots of Calvary chapels. And their main thing is constantly, constantly studying scripture. And I would like to create a network of group of people that just want to study the scrolls. Memorize the calendar. It. it it takes some time, but it's not super hard. But look at the calendar, look at the stuff, look at the extra biblical stuff, compare it to the Bible, like a prophecy. I don't want to say a prophecy club, but kind of a revamping of the school of the prophets. And everybody wants to study the old stuff. We get together and study. And that's what I've tried to do. Um, because if you say certain things, I, I just want to be able to just spit out exactly what the scroll says and if the scroll says something that's not appropriate these days you could get kicked off of youtube and facebook and all that so we started a private network and it's it's off of the website but we want to do stuff like that so we can all get together we can all study not argue but study and take stuff and then a lot of them now are talking about starting up uh, dead sea scroll study classes in their various churches i think that's fantastic so if you want to do that, that would be fantastic. Welcome aboard, too, by the way. And we're here, so if you want to talk about things, we can do that, too, and try to figure stuff out. I don't know everything, but when you do give me the questions, especially if I'm not sure, then I, I, there's something for me to research. Many contemporary Bible scholars think that Tarshish equates to Spain. Can you clarify why? they would believe this when you have discerned that it's referring to Britain. Yeah, the, the idea is when you first start out not knowing what it is, and there's very few references, you just break the word up. So Tarshish, ish means man in Hebrew. Tarsh is a word for um, uh, tin. And so it was speculated that the large tin mines would be that. There's one in Russia, but that's landlocked. So you wouldn't have ships coming from there. There's one in Spain and there's one in Britain. So it's either Spain or Britain. And almost everybody says, yeah, it's got to be either Spain or Britain or both maybe, you know, in some way. But tin mines, uh, people that bring tin. Um, and so at that point, most people figured, well, Spain is closer to the Middle East. We don't know if they ever got as far as Britain or America or anything else. So most likely it's Spain. So that's a very, very good guess. Uh, the thing is in Isaiah... Uh, 60 or 61, it talks about how uh, when Israel comes back in 1948 type time frame, the ships of Tarshish would be the first to bring their sons from afar. So it's either Spain or Britain, the Tarshish people, you know, 10 people uh, that are, are mandated to bring uh, the Jews back to Israel and create a nation. Well, after World War II, the mandate was given, or World War, yeah, in the World War, the mandate was given to um, Britain as far as uh, the Palestine area to divide it up and, and do that and make a homeland for the Jews. It wasn't Spain, it was Britain. So that's why. And it doesn't really matter a whole lot. It very easily could have been Spain and Britain as far as the ships, merchant, uh, and that could be like merchant lines. But either way, it was that. So the prophecy of Isaiah would pinpoint it to be Britain. Good question, though. That's just like some people say, well, Magog might be southern Russia, but it might be other things. Yeah, because people did branch out. But if you go back to the book of Jasher, for instance, which is another history book, the, the scripture quotes, it makes it very clear that the Magogites were in that area 
and they're the Scythians. Josephus will even mention that by name. But uh, Jasher will actually give you the first two or three names of the Scythian kings, because that's about the time of the Tower of Babel, and they're making a mention of how the names are always different. So anyway, so if you know it's the Scythian kings, and you know for sure because it names the first, be like us mentioning America, and you're saying, I don't know if that's North America or South America. Well, it's got something to do with a guy named Washington, the George something. Well, at that point, it'd be like, aha, it's North America. So it's the same thing. They mentioned those names. So when you pull those together, and that's, again, people will say, well, that's, you know, not the Bible. It may not be reliable. Okay, maybe not. And don't want to argue. I'm just trying to find anything that's written. Uh, Paul in, I think it's first or second Corinthians, it's chapter four, verse six or six, verse four. I'm bad with my numbers these days. Anyway, he says nothing beyond that, which is written. And I think that's a really, really good thing for us. These things may be off, but at least there's something written. And it's much to me, it's much more logical to look at an early church father, look at a Dead Sea Scroll. Maybe I'm interpreting it wrong. But at least I'm going somewhere. I'm basing it on something rather than just uh, somebody thought one plus one is two and they go that way. So I don't know. It, I'm just trying to to pull it together like that. And I'm definitely not saying I'm right in everything. I'm just trying to put it together. And if we all put our heads together, we can figure this out. Uh, what is your opinion? I don't remember clicking on that. What is your opinion? The best translation from Hebrew to English. Uh, I'm not. I guess it depends on what it is. For the Bible, um, I would probably use the uh, New or Old King James. Not that it might be the best translation of the Hebrew, but the fact that they're not missing verses. Uh, if you're talking about Dead Sea Scrolls, there are several things. There's well, my, my translations I like, but then there's also uh, the DJD, the Discoveries in the Judean Desert. That's got all the manuscripts and the photos and everything. If you can get those, they're kind of hard to come by. And there's several other people that have done Dead, Dead Sea Scroll reader editions and things like that, which some we've got some of those or listed anyway on the website. Rick Runner said that the word translated as fearful in Luke 21, 11 also means monsters. How do monsters reappear at the end of the age? Well, I don't know that they do, but there, there are several manuscripts that talk about Nephilim something coming back. And obviously, it's at the very least what's going on now. The whole concept of the Nephilim is... Uh, the angels or whomever learning to genetically modify. And so they create what we would call monsters or, you know, creatures that creatures, people, whatever, that are vastly different from us, very dangerous. Um, so even if that doesn't happen again, like it happened back pre-flood, the technology is here. I mean, we've started doing stuff like uh, trying to modify pig hearts and pig lungs so people could have, you know, transplants great idea to save lives but changing the genetics to make it fit what you think it should do and then all these viruses that they're beginning again that's what a military would do they take the technology turn it into a killer virus or a killer monster type thing or whatever or even like a bumblebee or something that might be deadly that reproduces quickly that only they have an antidote for all sorts of scenarios you could do poison the food supply and so if they're immune to it and we're not just lots of stuff but tampering with the genetics is is the line that becomes nephilim medicine according to the scrolls and we're supposed to be very very careful with that kind of thing so if that i'll have to look that up and see but if that's that's a possibility that would be uh very interesting luke 21 11 I'm going to look that up real quick just to make sure, and then we'll get to our last questions. Luke 21, 11. I don't remember that, but fearful sights. Okay, I will look that up in a little bit.
thank you for sharing that. That would be interesting. Uh, Cheryl became a member. Welcome aboard. Thank you for becoming a member. Uh, and then Brad became a member. Thank you very much. And let's see. I heard Steve Quayle say that the Rockefellers were hiding about 360 books, Enoch and, and you know, others. Have you heard of other texts being purposely hidden? Yes, I have. Um, and there's, well, let me let me back up from that. As far as purposely hidden, no. Uh, when the Israelis started getting the scrolls, there were some reports, and, I, and they seem to be very well documented, that other people, collectors, came in to buy scrolls. That, that happens everywhere. So there were some scrolls that are not known to be Dead Sea Scrolls that were sold to other people. And that could be as simple as like, you know, some ancient document, I'm going to sell you a cow for two goats, or there's all sorts of documents like that in there. But there were rumors of a complete book of Enoch in Aramaic. R.H. Charles had said that there were rumors of Gad, Ahijah, the Lost Five, which we talk about occasionally, um, in there. Now, we have managed to get a hold of uh, several Hebrew manuscripts of Gad. They've, they've in this last century, kind of come out. Plus, there is a couple of uh, translations uh, in other languages. And uh, then when the last one came out, I was able to pull together. So we do have one or two translations that you can buy on Amazon of Gad. So I highly recommend Gad. Uh, and then there's the other four of that five, which apparently we still can't get a hold of. I've got some fragments of Nathan, which I talk about every so often. Uh, but yeah, 360 books, I don't know, but there are definitely other books out there. I mean, the scripture tell, tells us to look for Jasher and Gad and Nathan and Enoch and things like that. So just out of... Um, make mention here this is our website biblefacts.org and if you go up here to a bookstore these are all the books we've written so we've got uh enoch and here's gad the one we were talking about so one of the very interesting things patriarchal texts the prophetical things that they base their theology on that was amazing dead sea scroll calendar and then other things so you can come there and look and then there's other other translators have done translations of those too so Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if they've purposely been hidden. There's a lot of things like that. 11Q13 is one manuscript we talk about a lot, and it's the theology is Christian. So the fact that they believed it way before Christ came is amazing. And it's something that obviously they wouldn't want people to know, uh, or some people wouldn't. Um, but was it really kept out of the picture for that reason? You, you, you can't really blame, or I mean, know for sure you know the reason you can just know for sure what happened it was kept out of the picture until the 1990s became a member i welcome aboard thank you glad you're here uh super sticker ten dollars thank you god bless you guys uh became a member that's great thank you and how far will God allow uh, this genetic tampering to go? Well, it, it, it got really bad before. And one of the texts talks about, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. So if we are getting close to the rapture, it's going to get really weird. I think the things we have to watch out for is, um, I mean, if they mutate pigs or bears or something out. I don't know if you where you're at, but if there's wild pigs running running around, just normal rat, wild pigs, got to be careful because they they're very very dangerous. So don't go anywhere without some weapons, just in case. Um, but if they mutate things like flies or, or mosquitoes or something, that could be very dangerous. Mutated much more likely is mutated viruses because that would be much easier to do. Um, but yeah, as far as what you can do, I would be very careful in trying to get like a heart transplant or whatever. It's much better to do the herbal medicine that the scrolls talk about. You probably will never need a heart transplant. Um, you know, I mean, it's just 
not saying that if you do, it's a sin, but it's you, we need to know where those lines are. You know, I'm not saying it's a sin to drink alcohol, but I don't want you to become an alcoholic either. So there's a line. And if you cross it, you risk something. Just be intelligent and make your decision. Be careful and just know that these things that these things are dangerous. So and I'm not sure how far it will go. I've seen some amazing things that have been done. Um, and I think what happened the last couple of years has showed us there could be some dangers too. So I, like, like it said, obviously there's several texts that talk about the technology coming back, not necessarily the fallen angels, except for what we just looked at tonight about the fallen angel problem with Iran. So that's interesting. So again, that's the whole, if there is a, a fallen angel that's released, uh, it makes me wonder what kind of genetic uh, things does Iran have? Like they just said that if if Israel attacks them, they're going to come out with weapons that you don't know that we have. Now that could just be a way of trying to scare you. Um, and maybe they're talking about an even bigger bomb on a drone or something. But are they talking about anything biological? It's interesting. I'm glad I'm in America, but it's just, there's a lot of stuff we don't know and we won't know until it actually happens, but at least we have these scrolls. The Mexico expedition by Steve Quayle says that their artifacts have over 200 hybrid monsters mentioned. Are you familiar with these from Mexico or any other countries? I'm familiar with the ones in Peru that Ellie Marzulli did. A lot of people have talked about the ones with Steve Quayle. I have not looked at in depth. I, I know what you're talking about, and it looks very interesting to find that stuff. Um, but I'll have to look into it. That might be something that we can do. And then in our study this summer on the post flood Nephilim, I might be able to find out more about that. But there have been things like that around, um, like when we talked about the Genesis 36 Nephilim, uh, which is not mentioned hardly by anybody, but. There's things like that, and we found later on, actually, uh, tablets about that kind of stuff. So it'll be really interesting to, to look at. But remember, don't be scared because the Lord is in control and he has a plan for us. But now is the day of salvation. Our last question is, are you going to publish a book on the Essene medicine? Yes, if I can ever get a hold of it. There are a lot of uh, texts that talk about it. And in some cases, they'll give us a clue or a cure for this or, or this herb or whatever. And they give us ideas. Uh, but the actual book of Hagi, I have not found yet. But hopefully that will come out in the near future. We know that their normal lifespan was 120 when everybody else was dying at 60. So now our normal lifespan is 80. And we should at least be able to get to 120. And if you use the, the techniques that they have, I know a half a dozen of them. So we should be able to eliminate heart attacks, all that kind of stuff. And the herbs that they talk about or that we can replicate or figure out what are connected. Uh, and there's ways of doing that. We study that a little bit on the network. Um, but uh, it does help out quite a bit. We've had some good successes with it. See, that's one thing that I don't dare talk about on YouTube because they're going to say, well, now you're trying to sell drugs and you don't have a license as, as a doctor. Therefore, you're practicing medicine without a license. And some of you know Josh Peck. He got bumped off for that particular reason. And I think they were already mad at him for other reasons, too, because there's plenty of people out there that speculate on herbs. But still, it's just one of those things we want to be careful with. I don't want to get bumped off of YouTube and not be able to see you guys. <laughs> So we got to be careful. But yeah, if we definitely have, we, we published a book uh, last year. Where'd it go? Um, this one here, The New Covenant of Damascus. And that's about their theology. But there is a chapter in the book on Hagi, which gives you some of the stuff that we knew uh, about. I don't know that it has. Okay, it's not on here. But anyway, um, We've looked at it before, and we'll, we'll definitely look at it again. But we will definitely keep trying to do that, too. We'll get there, I think, of the Lord. One more question popped in, and then I definitely need to go. Uh, have you ever heard of Dr. Christian 
uh, Winder of the End Time Berean? I don't think so. He has a very interesting take on these events, controversial but thought-provoking. I will have to look him up and see. So uh, we'll, we'll do that. Thank you for the information. Okay, we'll go ahead and say good night, and we'll be back next Monday. We're continuing to do these on Monday nights and do these studies, and we'll, we'll see what's happening with Iran and Israel over this next week. So remember to pray for Israel and be serious about prophecies and, and study on your own. God bless you guys, and we will see you later.